I am an avid backpacker and two weekends ago I took my boyfriend on his first backpacking trip. We did a short one night out and back in Colorado's front range. He's an asthmatic so I decided to keep it short and light until I knew how strong of a hiker he was. The trail we took started from Echo Lake Park which, for those unfamiliar with the area, receives a couple hundred visitors each weekend, quite busy by backcountry standards. The particular trail we were on, Chicago Lakes Trail, is quite a popular day hike. But we decided to make it an overnighter. After about two hours or so of hiking we reached the lower Chicago Lake. We ran into a group of 820-somethings who were planning to camp at the lake and chatted them up for a bit before continuing to Upper Chicago Lake. The upper lake is about a half mile past and 300 feet higher than the lower lake with lovely views overlooking the lower lake. Upon arriving we were the only ones there, along with 330-something men and, despite the exposure to high winds, decided it would be a good place to set up camp. We got a late start to the day so by the time camp was all set up it was about 6 p.m. and the sun had settled behind the mountains. The last of the day hikers had since left and we were the only tent set up at the upper lake. It was getting pretty windy and chilly so we decided to retire to the tent for the night. We ate dinner overlooking the lower lake from our tent and then zipped ourselves in. We stayed up for a bit longer before dozing off. At some point later, who knows how much later, I was awoken by what I thought were heavy winds. After listening for a bit, I decided something alive was out there, maybe a pika, maybe a ground squirrel, maybe a bear. I woke Alex up because I was a little nervous. After listening for a bit, he agreed the rustling was definitely something other than the wind. We kept as quiet as possible hoping not to spook it, just in case it did turn out to be something larger and stronger than us. We both located and unsheathed our knives without really consulting the other. I guess we were both a little nervous at this point. And then he saw it, oriented towards the left side of the tent from where we were laying, and he put his hand over my mouth to tell me to keep hushed and pointed to it. Lo and behold, there was the shadow of a human silhouette being cast upon our tent. It was a full moon night, so it was practically as bright as day outside, so bright that you could walk around without a headlamp no problem. I think this is what allowed the shadow to be created. Anyways, we both stayed as quiet as possible, desperately trying not to alert whoever the hell was outside of our tent that we were awake, knives pointed in their direction. We stayed still for what seemed like an eternity, staring at the shadow as the wind came and went in bursts. Finally, they moved and a hand touched the tent. Now I don't mean a hand grazed our tent. This person reached their hand out and put enough pressure on the tent to the point that the rainfly depressed into the tent and you could see the outline of the hand on the tent. And then, after about 10 seconds, the hand was no longer on our tent. The shadow retreated and we heard some rustling then not a damn thing other than the wind for the rest of the night. Needless to say, we didn't get a wink of sleep. We didn't even make a peep for an hour or so after the incident. Alex practically suffocated me because he was insistent on covering me with most of his body so he could protect me if they came back. Around 7 a.m. we finally emerged from the tent. There were zero signs of other campers. But there was one thing, about two feet from our tent was a big lighter. It wasn't mine and it wasn't Alex's and we were pretty damn sure that neither of us saw it the evening before. If we had, one of us would have surely picked it up because, you know, leave no trace at all. We packed up camp just as the first day hikers and trail runners were making their way up to the lake. By the time we got back down to the lower lake, the group we encountered the previous afternoon had already packed up and moved on too. So, yep, that's my story. I don't really have a clever ending to tie it all together, but I can say this. It is a uniquely terrifying experience being five or more miles from the trailhead and many more miles still from civilization when something like this happens. I think I would have driven myself mad if Alex hadn't been there with me that night. But, despite our little experience, he has assured me he'll let me take him backpacking again. Probably not to Chi Lakes, though. I am a 33-year-old white female from Los Angeles. Three years ago, my boyfriend and Ivis planned for five years, turned 30, sold everything we owned including my car, took his trailblazer and decided to just travel around the states and Canada. 
I guess you could call us backpackers, as we tend to chase good weather, find a state park, and backcountry hike into the wilderness for days at a time. My brother likes to joke that we are anti-establishment hippies. We don't necessarily live off the grid, but between the two of us we have one prepaid phone we use for emergencies or checking in with family slash friends, and one MacBook which I use for work. I'm a freelance writer slash content creator and I am a retainer with a robotics company. I mostly write boring white papers or web content. The whole point of our living situation is to live debt free and have as few bills as possible. I only use free Wi-Fi, so one to two times a week we have to go to a city with a Starbucks. This background info is only important so you know more about who we are and how simply we live. Neither of us is involved in social media and know very little of Reddit, Instagram, or use any apps because our phone isn't a smartphone, plus we don't even text. Last summer, we decided to do some backcountry hiking in Arkansas. It's one of those states you don't ever really hear about other hikers visiting, but we read that it had some beautiful natural landscape, and it does. The rules at this particular park were pretty lax. We didn't need a permit. There were a few basic laws slash guidelines, but there was no check-in needed. We had all the basics and had planned to do a six-day hike. Three in, three out. The whole time we were out there we didn't see or hear another soul, but on day one, we were prepping to move off trail and find a camping spot as it was getting near dusk. We took what looked like kind of an animal trail and about half a mile out we saw a green, two-person tent. It was almost camouflaged in the foliage so we came on it almost by accident. Some backpackers prefer privacy, others are more social. We're the more social type. We've had some great experiences camping near other backpackers, sharing stories, food, and a joint or two. We were around 30 yards away from the tent. It was zipped closed, so my boyfriend shouted a greeting to make our presence known. No movement and no sound. We assumed Green Tent Guy either wasn't around or didn't want to be bothered, so we started off in a new direction to get some distance between us. We camped. Never heard a peep. We moved along the next morning, completely forgetting about Green Tent Guy, until nearing the end of day five on our trek back. We were again looking for a spot to camp off the trail when we came up on the Green Tent again. This isn't that unusual, but normally backcountry hikers keep moving, so we really weren't expecting it. The tent flap was open, so my boyfriend yelled his greeting again and nothing. My boyfriend wants to go check it out saying, it's weird, and maybe someone is hurt. I didn't like the idea from the get-go, because even though we hadn't had any bad experiences personally, we'd heard enough stories from other backpackers about hermits and mountain men that want privacy, carry guns, etc., but my boyfriend assured me we'd be fine and if all else fails, offer him some weed to keep the peace and we'd go on our way. As soon as we get within 20 yards of the place, the smell of decomposition is intense. My boyfriend has been hailing his greeting over the last 20 yards and once the smell hits him, he stops and turns to me and says, what if we find a dead body? My skin crawled. I was immediately afraid. I've never seen a dead body before and don't want to. The closer we got to the tent, the worse the smell got. I knew for sure we were going to walk in and see some old campers rotting corpse. What we found was worse than that. Outside the tent was a dead doe's legs, covered in flies. It looked like the legs had been cut most of the way and then ripped off the rest of the way. It was a mess. Inside was the body and head of the deer but the middle portion was swaddled in a blue fleece blanket that was blood-soaked at the bottom, where the legs used to be. It was laying on its side, bottom facing the tent entry. The tail had been cut off, and the anus slash vagina was covered in dried blood and agape. Like something had been penetrating it. The same with its mouth. The bottom portion was bent down at a scary broken-looking angle. The tent was open, so we could see everything without having to go inside. Not that we would have anyway, because at this point the smell was almost debilitating. There was a dirty, almost empty clear bottle of Jergens baby oil, a stained green and white fringed kitchen towel. That was it. I immediately started crying and begged him to go. All he could muster was what, the hell, and we turned and ran. 
We ran to the trail and jogged down it for as far as we could go until dusk was fully on us and we had to set up camp. We didn't go very far off the trail and neither of us slept. We didn't start a fire or use headlamps after full dark. We just sat up whispering to each other, going over and over what we had just seen. Every little noise startled us. It was like our brains were on red alert. I kept thinking any moment a dead deer hunter would come back to his tent, see our footprints or something, know we were there and track us back to our tent. I've never been so scared in my entire life. Just before dawn we tore down and started out. My boyfriend stopped at the ranger station on our way out of the park to report what we had seen. The ranger was a young guy around our age and he looked as freaked out by our story as we were telling it. He wrote most of it down and my boyfriend showed him on a map approximately where it had been. He asked if we knew how the deer was killed and at that point we hadn't even thought about it. We just assumed it had been shot but because of the blanket we didn't see a wound but we weren't exactly giving it an autopsy either. We have since shortened our backcountry hikes to a maximum of four days. We've also been a lot less eager to call out to other campsites and have never approached another unmanned tent again. My brother-in-law just heard this story this past Christmas and he has been telling my sister and I that we should post it somewhere, here, anywhere. I am surprised that my sister had never told him this story but it really did scare her at the time and we never discussed it much after a point in time and I mean it was almost 20 years ago that this happened. So it's an old story and I'm pretty sure no one is in imminent danger. My family has some property that backs up to Carson National Forest in New Mexico. It's been in the family for years and my sister and I both spent our summers up there. It's gorgeous, well it is for people who live out in far west Texas, nice and green, cool mountain air in the summer. It was always a relief to get up there and away from the dusty ranch. My dad was ex-military and had two daughters, let's just say we did lots of outdoor stuff. He taught us survival skills and how to defend ourselves. We hunted and fished and did lots of camping and hiking. To us it was always a fun time, but I guess he felt the need to pass on his skills to us. We spent several weeks in the summer up there hiking with him and exploring the old cabins, mining communities, and checking the big ditch project that was built for the Red River back in the late 1800s. I think that's the correct date for that project, but I am not sure. Anyways, it's a great place to hike with some beautiful high mountain lakes, streams, lots of wildlife, etc. This happened when I was in college and my younger sister was still in high school. My dad was still at home having to work and would come up every few weeks to spend time with us. We were up there with our mom and she mainly spent time in town or around the property painting. We spent our time on the jeep trails or hiking and sleeping. It was late June, maybe early July, I think, and we had decided we were going to hike up to Lost Lake. It's one of my favorite lakes up there because if you look at it from a certain angle, it looks like a heart. We set off in the morning and were prepared. We both had a small pack, our water, some snacks, and we both had a small hammock we planned to set up once we got to the lake so we could just enjoy the area for a while. I will admit to being to an outdoor type and swear when it's quiet enough you can hear the trees talk. We also both always carried a knife when we hiked. My dad always insisted we have something, just in case an accident happened or we just needed it. The hike was going good, since the summer cabin is pretty far up the valley we just set out on foot to the trailhead. To get to Lost Lake you take another trail that goes up to Middle Fork Lake. Then you break off that trail for Lost Lake. We ran into a few other hikers, but they were going to Middle Fork Lake and we were pleased because it looked like we could possibly have Lost Lake all to ourselves. It's a pretty good hike with some long switchbacks at the end, but totally worth it because the lake is just beautiful and a very pretty emerald green in color. We got there and saw that we did have the lake to ourselves. We hiked around the lake and decided to hike back a bit to find a good spot to set up our hammocks. We walked into the tree line and the first thing my sister said was, do you smell that? And yep, I did. It was a dead animal with a strong scent of blood. We had both done lots of hunting and knew that smell. And that's when I saw it. It was a deer carcass, but what was around it was what disgusted me. 
placed around the deer carcass in a circle where its organ, entrails, etc. But it wasn't like it was being cleaned, it's like they were placed in a certain arrangement. With little piles of rocks in between everything. Now I know how some people get disgusting with their kills and I have had some guys try to gross me out, but I don't fall for crap like that. But this made me uneasy. It wasn't just being cleaned, it was like it was set up in a certain meaning, or it had meaning. I stepped back from this weird circle and then my sister started to say my name but stopped. Because then we see the guy who had done this. And he looks like he just climbed out from inside the deer because he is covered in blood and doesn't have much clothing on. At first I thought he didn't have anything on, but honestly I didn't try to check him out much. He was standing back away from his gruesome little circle just standing close to a group of trees that were pretty close together. He was maybe 20 feet from us. I think he was maybe trying to hide. Not for sure, but my dad had always taught us that if we ever found ourselves in a situation where we didn't feel in control or to do everything in our power to try to take control of the situation. Do something that is going to take the other person by surprise. Don't do what they expect you to do. So this was raging through my brain and I also could tell my sister was about to freak the heck out so I stepped up and said, Hey, pretty good kill you got there. Did you use a bow? The guy just stood there, his eyes all crazy wide like he was stoked out of his brain on planet Pluto. So I'm thinking, great, we ran into a guy getting his hunt on and he had lost it and was getting blood crazy with his deer. He was staring me down and I was staring right back and my sister was getting ready to run. I still don't know what came over me, but I then put my hand on my knife that I kept on my waist just to show him that I wasn't completely helpless. I don't know why I did it, but something told me to let him know that I wasn't going to back down or be afraid. I kept that contact with him and I would guess he was maybe in his early 30s. But I am bad at guessing people's ages. He was pretty dirty though. You could tell that even with all the blood he had everywhere. I start to back off and my sister had moved behind me, so I spoke again and said, So, you have a great hunting day again the crazy didn't say a thing, just stood there like he was a statue or something, or like he thought I couldn't see him if he didn't move or make any sound. We moved back to the lakeside again and booked it around the lake. My sister stayed up front and she was shaking pretty bad. I was mainly pissed off at first because if he wanted to get all crazy in the woods with his deer then he should have gone further back up in the forest. We get back to the trailhead and stopped to get our bearings and looked at each other. I was scanning the forest line to make sure we weren't being followed and my sister was just in shock. We started down the trail pretty fast and I was hoping I could keep my sister together until we could at least reach the Middle Fork Lake Trail or that we would even run into some more hikers. But the odds weren't good on this particular trail because you have to get an early start on the Lost Lake Trail and by now it was late morning or early noon. We were making good time and hadn't discussed what we saw, just started hiking back down. I started to get that feeling when you just know you aren't alone. I kept checking but I didn't see anything or even hear anything at first. My sister refused to look back and just kept going but I felt that I had to keep checking to make sure the idiot wasn't following us. That's when the first stuff came flying at us. It was some small pebbles, but it really pissed me off because it was obvious someone was throwing them at us and it could have only been him. My sister was almost running at this point. But I am a mouthy smart aleck. I blame the Texas upbringing and darn it, this was my forest. I had grown up here and these were my lakes, my trails, and I wasn't about to let some crazy dude ruin it for me. I started yelling back that he needed to go back to his deer and leave us alone. At this point my sister is telling me to shut up and just come on. And I am thinking no way, this guy is just trying to scare us. The pebbles stopped and then we started hearing barking and growling noises. My sister said now he is growling at us and I just told her to get on down the trail and ignore it. He was behind us pretty much the whole way growling and making these barking noises every once in a while, but I never caught a glimpse of him. Once we got close to where the trail joined in with the Middle Fork Trail, he seemed to back off. I never caught sight of him behind us, but I could hear him and I just knew he was there. We started down the rest of the trail. My sister refused to stop or look behind her, so I kept checking every so often. Didn't see anything or hear anything. 
We started to discuss what had happened and she felt like he was very sinister and felt like we had been in a dangerous situation. I felt like he was just getting his kicks out of scaring two girls. I mean, he had to have heard us coming around the lake. We weren't being quiet. It was the opposite because there are black bears up there and we would always be pretty loud while hiking, hoping to scare off any bear in the area so we wouldn't come up on one. To this day she still thinks he was sinister and I think he was just trying to scare two girls and was getting his kicks out of it. We told our parents and my dad didn't like what he heard. He did teach us some more up close defense skills after that day and forbid us from ever hiking alone or just the two of us again. We didn't hike up that trail for several years with anyone. It freaked my sister out and I just didn't like remembering a time I was scared in the forest that I considered my own. I didn't know it at the time, but after we had gotten back to the house and told my mom she had called some neighbors and a few of the men hiked up there the next day to check things out. They did find the deer carcass and some empty hiking packs like what day hikers use, but they were empty. They also found a rustic campsite further back in the woods that had been cleared out as well. Back in my early 20s, I moved to Melbourne to go to university. Because of some of my dodgy mates I knew from outside of my university, I somehow wound up as a go-to guy for drugs with my classmates. I freaking hated the reputation, but maybe felt a little bit cool at the same time. Ecstasy and speed mostly. I was at the bottom of the drug dealer food chain, the type of idiot who jacks the price up $10 a pill so he can make enough money to drink and party. I had no guilt of ripping these people off, these were mostly rich kids who lived with their parents and didn't have to have a job to support themselves through university. Dealing them with drugs was so easy and non-threatening. A few years after I finished university, I was working an office job that was boring and paid peanuts. By now my friends and I had pretty much grown out of the desire to take drugs on weekends, dinner parties with good food, good wine and good conversations was more our idea of fun now. My drug dealing days had well and truly finished. Or so I thought. It was 11 p.m. on a Tuesday night. I just got home from a draining day at work and was exhausted and in a bad mood. I plunked myself on the couch, stared at the ceiling trying to muster up the energy to get up and shower before bed. My phone starts flashing and vibrating on the coffee table next to me. I looked at the caller ID and it was T-Bone, the nickname I had for a guy who I met at a festival years ago and ended up spending a bit of time here and there. He was a huge friendly weed smoking slash acid tripping hipster with an impressive beard. I hadn't spoken to this guy in well over a year, so when I saw his caller ID on my phone I immediately thought, ah, uh, he needs drugs. I answered and we exchanged some pleasantries and then I could hear the tone in his voice change to that awkward, hey could I ask you a favor, tone. He wanted drugs and lots of them, $2,000 worth to be precise. When I asked him what specifically he wanted he just said, as many bags that I can get, he laughed. This was way outside my comfort zone, even when I was dealing back in university, 10 pills was usually the maximum I would offload at any one time. It was late, I was tired, but I was also broke and figured that I could clear an easy $500 after purchasing from one of my guys I used to buy from, something which T-Bone didn't need to know. I told T-Bone that I would call him back and see what I can do. To my surprise, the first person I called was Stover and he was able to help me out and he was only a 5 minute drive from me. We discussed the terms and conditions which seemed reasonable, 60 E's and 3 grams of speed for $1,500. I called T-Bone and he was happy to part with $2,000 for this amount. I met Stover out front of his luxurious apartment building, we had a quick chat and he joked about wanting to meet the guy I'm selling to. We shook hands and I was on my way to T-Bone. I asked T-Bone where he wanted to meet and he told me where he was. I Google mapped the address. It was a 45 minute drive from me. Had I known he was this far away, I wouldn't have agreed to sell him anything. But I couldn't back out now. The address he gave me was in what is probably the worst neighborhoods in Australia, known for its violent crimes, murder, and of course drug dealing. For anyone reading this living outside of Australia, they certainly don't show this crap hole in the tourist brochures. 
I also won't mention the name of the place, because I don't wish to offend anyone reading this that might live there. I started the journey. I now had plenty of time to think about how stupid I am. I had a ridiculously illegal amount of drugs on me, driving out to the roughest neighborhoods in the country. After ages of sitting on the freeway, I took the exit and was approaching my destination. At this point, I was so tired that I was in an almost dreamlike state. Every set of lights I pulled up to, people in cars next to me would give me greasy looks trying to act hard and start a confrontation. I pulled into the street where the house was. Your destination is on your left, my phone told me. The street was so dark because the street lights were out and there was cloud cover, so no moan. I couldn't see crap. The houses in this street looked dilapidated and abandoned. This didn't feel right. The house that T-Bone said he was at had boarded up front windows, crappy graffiti tags on them, and there weren't any lights on. I called T-Bone. No answer. For freak's sake. I redialed and thought it was about to ring out when he picked up. Hey T-Bone, I'm out front. Ah. Cool. Come on in, he said no, come out to the car, I replied. Hang on a sec, he said, and hung up. I was thinking, crap, I hardly know this guy. He had been at a few parties I went to, we hung out, but I don't know anything about him. I saw him emerge from the side of the house, pushing through bushes that blocked the pathway. I was the only car parked on the street. He saw me and gestured for me to come on over. I had no idea who he was with, so I thought it was time to get into character. I took my jacket off so I was only wearing a white singlet and put my filthy black trucker cap on that I kept in the glove box. I was hoping this would help me to look a bit more don't F with me. My friends often joke about how I look tougher than I am. I have some football and kickboxing induced facial scars combined with a pretty large physique from smashing weights for years. I was big enough and scary looking enough to be intimidating. But truth be known, I'm really a freaking marshmallow who avoids confrontations. I shook hands with T-Bone in the front yard of this place. I felt at ease when he gave me a happy greeting and thanked me for coming out this way. He told me to follow him and we went through the bushes around to the back of this place. I could hear music. Sounds like they were pumping dubstep through crappy distorting speakers. I could hear a few people's voices and I could smell cigarette smoke. T-Bone ripped the back door open and the smell and sound hit me harder. I've been to some nasty house parties, but this was horrific. There were three of them in the kitchen. There was a flashlight attached by string to the 12-foot ceiling swinging back and forward slowly pendulum style. This was the only lighting. The swinging light made it difficult to see the people in the kitchen, but with each sway I would catch a glimpse of their faces. They were absolute toothless junkies, all shirtless, skinny with bad tattoos. We entered the kitchen and one of them closed the door behind us and stood in front of it, arms folded as if he was guarding it. One of them came forward and told me his name was Jay, not like he was introducing himself, it was more of a statement. His face was full-blown meth infested. He sized me up and then looked at T-Bone and said, I thought you said he was a square. T-Bone looked at him in total shock. As Jay turned to T-Bone, the flashlight swung past and I noticed he was holding a big screwdriver behind his back. Now I realized what was happening and felt like an idiot. I've walked into a freaking ambush. Get a guy with a crap load of drugs to come around and rob him. I thought I was finished. Jay turned back to me. He was about six feet away from me. He showed me the screwdriver and said, what have you got for me, with big front teeth missing a smile. The fact I was so tired and pissed off kind of worked for me because I didn't show I was crapping myself. I squared up to him and said in a no-nonsense tone, give me the cash and I'll show you. To which Jay replied, nah, T-Bone told you these were on tick mate. On tick, meaning I'll pay you later or never in this case. I looked at T-Bone who looked back at me and shook his head and mouthed I'm sorry. Jay looked at me with such hatred it looked as though he was in pain. Give us the freaking gear dude. If it wasn't so dark in this crap hole, he could have easily seen my overinflated pocket where the drugs were stashed in an envelope. I looked at the guy in front of the door and as soon as our eyes met, 
he put his arm over the door handle, confirming that he wasn't going to let me leave. We all stood there trading glances. The swinging light made everyone's shadows look like they were moving. Jay didn't like this. T-Bone broke the silence and said, Jay chill the hell out I'll get the money, and he left the kitchen. I thought he was going to bail on me, who has $2,000 cash just lying around. Jay slowly came towards me pointing the screwdriver at me. He said in a raspy matter of fact tone, I'll freaking end it, I'll do it this time, don't try me. That's cute, I replied. Then the painful anger came back into his face. I've never seen anything like it. I slowly put my feet into a fight stance to prepare myself for what was about to happen. T-Bone walked back in and said, here's the cash which briefly diffused the situation. I did a quick count. It was $1,700, which was close enough. I threw the envelope of gear to Jay, the door guard moved, and I got the hell out. T-Bone followed me and he tried to give me an apology, he said, mate I had no freaking idea that was going to happen, I'm so sorry. I just said, you owe me $300 and drove away. I never got the extra $300 and I never dealt drugs again. I also, thankfully, never met Jay again. When I was much younger and far less concerned with consequences, I was introduced to a guy through a mutual friend that was well connected. It took me forever to figure out how this guy could stock a veritable roving pharmacy in his vehicle, but at the time I wasn't so much concerned with the how, just the when. Like, hey man, when can I purchase an irresponsible amount of diverted prescription medications from you? As I got to know him more, I learned more about my purveyor of happy pills, and he thoroughly threw off a bad vibe. I would do my absolute best to avoid the post-deal hangout, but the guy was clearly and completely socially awkward. Eventually, the dealer, I'll henceforth refer to him as Creep, starts attempting to insinuate himself into my group of friends more and more. He would call me constantly, text me like an abandoned Tinder date, and generally harass me to hang out. We would be casually drinking beer in the backyard of my house and he'd happen to be in the neighborhood. Just like he'd accidentally take a load off and decide to stick around. I am not a complete a-hole, so it was difficult to sell someone a clue who doesn't have a proverbial nickel to his name. I specifically remember a night when each of us were recounting macho stories of tussles and scrapes we'd been in and Creep decided it was his turn to contribute. It went something like, oh that's nothing man, one time I shot a man in the face with a sawed off shotgun and beat the rap on a self-defense technicality. We all sort of went slack jawed at this moment and nodded our heads, mumbling uncomfortably, wow that's pretty cool. At that point, I think we all just assumed he was a one-upper and would say whatever to reinforce the tough guy persona he was so desperate to have us believe. I should have realized then that maybe Creep wasn't exactly an asset to the societal fabric. But, you know, I didn't want to hurt the guy's feelings, plus he had drugs. A few weeks later into the summer, some of the boys and I decide to tie one on and head downtown to the clubs. Now, I know for a fact that I hadn't committed the felonious sin of imparting knowledge of our physical location to Creep, but somehow he materialized by my side as I was ordering a drink. Starting to get why Creep wasn't a pillar of social proficiency. Eventually, he was ejected from the club, and as a mission of pure mercy, I went outside to make sure he at least found a cab home. That's when I discovered what Creep was looking for in his pockets all night. As I walked outside, I could see several bouncers warily surrounding this portly whirling dervish of dip crap as he's brandishing a freaking six inches serrated fold-out knife at them. I still have no idea what possessed me to step in and corral him, and I still believe that the only reason I wasn't cut to absolute ribbons is because of the Gumby-like flexibility I'm afforded under the influence of alcohol and prescription medications. I was finally able to convince him into a taxi and sent him packing. At that point, I made a firm decision to stop doing drugs and by proxy, stop seeing Creep forever. I blocked his number and refused to go out. It's lucky that I did, because some months later, he found himself once again in a scuffle at that very same establishment, only this time I wasn't there to rescue him. He stabbed a man seven or eight times, and hot-footed it into an alley in some pitiful attempt at an escape. 
The police didn't have to do much sleuthing, as there were plenty of bystanders willing to point out his location. Creep is now in a level 4 prison, and isn't eligible for parole for another decade or so, and I say good. I am a 26-year-old male, and I am really close with a work colleague of mine, who is a 31-year-old female. She's currently going through a tough time with a guy who knocked her up and left her, so I've been making extra effort to be there for her. I always joke about her getting me into trouble and getting me involved in weird situations, but it's usually pretty harmless. So we arrange to come around my place. Her kids are with her ex-husband and she's kind of stuck at home doing nothing. I offer to cook her something and we watch a movie. Innocent enough, I pick her up at her place and drive her to mine. We laugh and joke about something on the 30-second walk from the parking spot to my place, and we walk past a pretty shoddy building that is situated right next to my apartment block. I've lived here over a year and really don't spend much time in the area I live in because it's just not the most amazing place. As I walk past this shoddy building, I see an angry-looking dude staring out of it, which I didn't really see as suspicious because I'm just used to freaks living nearby, and open the back door to the building and walk into my apartment. I was making a curry, and I like to let it stew for a couple hours, so as soon as I get home I prepare the ingredients. The friend asks if she can get some fresh air. I say sure, just open the window and make yourself at home. She opens it up, then I hear a rock or something hitting it, and she jumps backwards. I look outside to see the previous angry looking guy glaring at us screaming, come out you a hole. I think well he knows where I live and I don't want my friend getting into any trouble, so I walk downstairs and go talk to him. He's immediately irate. Keeps telling me I need to watch what I say and asks if I think I'm better than him. I have no clue what he's talking about and ask who he is. This just makes him angrier. The guy is slightly taller, bigger than me, and tries intimidating me. I never break eye contact or show signs of weakness in a confrontation despite thinking he's definitely going to beat the crap out of me. He says, I own five guns I could bust your kneecaps in, don't even test me. He continues, I could have ten dudes come over to your place in an hour to mess you up. I respond saying I have no idea who he is and I'm not looking for trouble. I feel visibly angry and want to strangle him, but I know it would end in my ass being kicked, so I stay cool. He demands that I apologize to him and I tell him I'm sorry if I hurt his feelings, but I have no idea why he's mad. My friend comes down, which I was dreading because she's as stubborn as me, tells him off for acting so childishly, and instead of lashing out at her, his demeanor changes entirely. He apologizes and says that I just make him really mad and that I piss him off to no end. After a couple of minutes of talking to her, he calms down completely. He asks me, hey, do you small weed? I tell him no, not really. He proceeds to tell me he knows my landlord, gives me my landlord's full name, and that he's a businessman. Tells me he does business with everyone in the apartment block except me and has a proposal for me. I hear him out, mostly because he seemed calm and collected now. He offers me a deal where I take something from him, keep it in my bedroom, and when he comes to collect it he pays me $5,000. Now I'm trying to get into university and that money would help me out, so I was tempted to say yes, but I declined and explained that my dad's a cop and I'm applying to work in a prison as a psychologist, so maybe I wouldn't be the best partner for this business venture. He must have pulled my number from someone because he sent me a text an hour later saying, tell your friend I'd love to go out with her. Obviously, I'm a little freaked out Todd he has my number, but I stay cool and don't reply. My friend and I at this point have eaten and watched a horror film together. I dropped her off home and that was that. Until the next day. He called me and wanted to know about my application for the prison job and I say that I declined. He proceeds to tell me I can make a bunch of money on the side if I help him out and I decline that too. He gets really upset and says, you're not a freaking grass are you? To which I laugh and say no. He tells me he will call me later but hasn't called in the last two months. I tried doing some digging and he's not the big shot he makes himself out to be, but regardless. 
This happened to me when I was 13. For some background, I had switched to another school that was further away from home. And now instead of just taking only one bus, I had to take a bus, a train, and then another bus to get there. With my now longer commute, I had to leave my house around 7 a.m. if I wanted to be there for 8.30 a.m. For the most part one was never worried about safety since public transit was busy in the morning. As I got off the train, I had to cross a big bridge in order to reach the area with the different bus routes. There were three major ones, but it didn't matter which one I got on as they all passed the school before breaking off into separate directions. So one morning, as I was waiting for one of the buses to show up, some random construction worker, also waiting for a bus, started talking to me. He looked to be in his mid-thirties. I didn't think much of it as I was easy to have a conversation with. I started seeing him more frequently at the bus area and I began to find it a bit strange because he would always compliment me. He'd say I had a cool bag or a nice jacket at first, but he never said anything to raise any red flags. Things started to get weird pretty quick and he would start complimenting my features, saying that I had pretty eyes or a cute smile. I was beginning to get a bit uncomfortable, but again I also brushed it off and chose to start avoiding him. I never thought too much of my own safety, as there were people around and I had a cell phone in case I had to call my parents or the police. I didn't see the guy for a few days so I began to think I was in the clear and forgot about him. Then things really began to escalate. I was sitting by myself with my earbuds and when suddenly someone tapped my shoulder and sat beside me. It was the guy and now he's talking to me like we are friends. I was really uncomfortable, tried to dismiss him and went to walk away to the other side of the bus area. But that's when he said something that really caught me off guard. He just casually turns to me like it's nothing and says, what would you do if I tied you up and never let you go? I was genuinely appalled. I got up from the bench and started walking away. He got up and started to follow behind me when thankfully two buses pulled in. He of course followed me onto the bus and I wasn't having it. So I got off and hopped onto the second one. If he followed me on again, I was going to tell the bus driver I needed help, but the guy didn't. I was so damn confused. I went to school and the first thing I did was tell my friends what happened. I really did not understand the severity of this situation at first because I was a 13 year old male and I didn't think these things happened to guys. As I was telling the story, I was kind of downplaying it because nothing bad actually happened in my eyes and there were no real repercussions. Everyone gave me a dumbfounded stare as no one knew what to say. Then, one of the teachers overheard me and in a look of shock, brought me to the principal's office. So I missed the entire first period of the day explaining what happened to the principal and a police officer. My parents at first were really confused on why I didn't mention anything about the weird guy before. I was driven to school the next few days until a police officer came over to talk to me and my parents. He said that they found the guy on the transit cameras and were able to track him down and talk to him. There wasn't too much the officer could do aside from telling him to stay away from me since he technically didn't do anything illegal. The officer did tell me that they would be monitoring the train station around that time as well and that if the guy ever approaches or talks to me to call 911. I saw him like two or three more times after he never spoke to me or even looked at me, which I'm very thankful for. I'm just glad nothing major came from it, but this did really open my eyes a lot about being more aware in public. I am a 30-year-old female. I used to live in a small neighborhood when I was ages 13 to 18. This took place when I was around 15. I spent most of my time just walking around the neighborhood listening to my MP3 player. There was a guy around the same age as me that lived maybe five or so houses down from me. From neighborhood gossip, I learned that he was homeschooled and had been in and out of juvie due to his anger issues. He was almost always outside, and sometimes when I passed his house he would start following me. I was smart enough to always have my music down low enough to be able to hear and be aware of my surroundings. At first, I just passed it off as he just ended up walking the same time of day I did. As time passed, he got closer and closer to me when following, until he eventually decided to come up right behind me. 
He said some truly heinous things that I will not repeat here. I mean he was right in my ear when he was talking. I ran home and told my sister, as she was basically who raised me. She told me I was lying and to stop making up stories. For a while, I stopped going out walking until I needed the fresh air and exercise and tried again after maybe two months. Sure enough, there he was and came right up behind me and started to say things again. I turned my music up and ignored him. This is what I continued to do every day until he got tired of me ignoring him I guess because one day he grabbed my arm, I couldn't get away, and then he grabbed the back of my neck. He told me that I should know better than to ignore him. Again, I told my sister, she didn't believe me, and I stopped going out again. Two weeks later, I woke up to loud bangs on my bedroom wall. There was a garage on both sides of the house, and the wall of my bedroom shared a wall with one of the garages. This garage was unfinished, there wasn't even concrete down, and it was easily accessible from outside as it was missing the door at the back of the house. My sister was out of town, my dad was deaf and bedridden, so it was just me in the house able to do anything. My bedroom also had a door to go outside, so I ran over and locked it. I laid down and waited for the banging to stop, but it didn't. My cousin and her boyfriend lived down the street, so I called her and she sent her boyfriend down to see what it was. Her boyfriend pulled right into the backyard and right up to the door into the garage. His headlights filled the garage and outran the guy from down the street, holding a large knife. He took off running and my cousin's boyfriend followed. It was at this time that I called the police. They came and took a statement, but said there was nothing they could do because other than going into the garage and trespassing, he didn't actually do anything. I never took a walk in that neighborhood again. I still wonder how he knew what wall to bang on. How did he know I was on the other side of it? How did he know my sister was gone, or that my dad was bedridden, and couldn't do anything? I never locked the door, so had he been in my house to know? What would have happened if I had gone outside? It still gives me the creeps. So, guy down the street, let's not meet again. Hey y'all, this took place the summer of 2022, and I just never thought of writing down this story because I was so stunned that it happened to me. So every summer in my city, me and my friends like to make small campfires and chill, secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay any campsite fee to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously so it's a nice last minute hang to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river that's really nice because no one usually goes there. The only thing to be worried about are bears though because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that and my house specifically is located right next to mountains and forest. So one particular night at 11 p.m., I decided to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I want us to be chilling once they all get there. The spot I get to has a two-minute paved walkway I have to go through and then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway are two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge slash the ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, lighter, small firewood, small shovel to dig out the pit, etc. I get to the spot and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers with their families during the hot summers. So I set up the chair and I get to digging the pit with only my flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water, but all of a sudden I hear a loud splash. A splash so loud that it can only come from something equally large like a two hand sized rock. I'm confused because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water even though I'm only a few feet away. I shine my flashlight at the water and I don't see anything, so I kind of just brush it off, thinking I'm just hearing things. But as I keep shoveling a bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point, I think something is falling from above, because logically something must be falling into the water. I point the flashlight above where some trees are above the river, and I don't see anything big enough to make a splash. So as I keep digging, with my heart rate kind of going at this point, I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over the river. 
I quickly grabbed my light and shined it towards where I heard the rustling. I called out, hello? No response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately, but there was no bear, or signs of anything for that matter. So I tell myself I'm just hearing things now because I've seen horror movies before and now my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled so I shine my flashlight over to the area again and as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress because honestly of all the things I was to see, I didn't think I'd see the naked back of a man. From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be mid-forties, shaved not bald, and medium-ish build, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all my crap and getting the hell out of there because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare or shoo me away. So after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all my stuff. I'm carrying all my things with me and briskly walk up the small ramp and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest and I am frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in Crocs mind you, so I'm hoping that if I have to book it out of there, I'd regret not being in sport mode from the get-go. I make it to the halfway point and a sense of relief starts setting in knowing I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But as I check behind me for the final time, I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours as if he was a primate walking. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly got up from his stance and started standing on his feet and positioned his body to face me. After setting himself into his new position, the man starts running towards me. I freaking book it. I run as hard as I can down the path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it, but I didn't care because a whole naked ass man was chasing me at 11 p.m. at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care. I wanted to make it out of this situation alive. I finally make it out of the forest and I run to my car which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get to my car and like a classic horror movie, I fumble with trying to get my key fob to unlock my car. I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, I'm actually dead but I brush the thought off and pick them back up. I get my fob properly, unlock my doors, and throw my things into my back seat before getting into my car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight, most likely took six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my key into the ignition, I am fixated on the end of the paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was coming still. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me, and I zoom out of the area as fast as possible. As I drive away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call on my phone. It was my friends calling me asking if I made it to the spot yet and all I say to them is, guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pull up to my house because again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area and I tell them the whole story the way that I told it just now. They swear that it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that and I also knew none of them would try to full sprint at me with their dom out. But as we're just talking out in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going towards the direction of where I encountered the naked man. I just yelled out to him, you'll be careful, there's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. He responds saying, oh damn really? I gotta go over that bridge to go home. All I tell him is good luck man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where in the area I saw these things. When we went to see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but the officer said they would make note of it anyways in case it happens again. Some friends say it's a skinwalker, others say more realistically it's either a homeless, mentally ill, or a drunk-slash-high person. 
One theory I've heard my friends say is that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on a past version of me. I was about 13 at the time, living in a middle-class suburb with a decent reputation despite increasing drug activity reports over the last several years. It had always seemed like a strangely quiet place to me, but I didn't have many friends, was growing up in a neglectful environment, so I can see in retrospect how I might have come to feel this way. I would ride my bike around for hours, seeing very few people outside their homes, and this led to an overwhelming sense that while outside, I was both completely alone and always being watched. One year, I somehow managed to befriend another kid in the neighborhood who lived just a couple streets over from me, and we'd travel back and forth from each other's houses almost every day. It was nice to have someone to be with. Made me feel less vulnerable, I guess. Plus, she was a few years older than me, which was a bonus. We decided to hang out after school like we did every day and just cruise around with nothing better to do. Me, being on a Razor scooter, and her on a bike, constantly teetering between all-out races and chiller, conversation-heavy spells. Oh, another important bit of info is that by this point, I'd already been diagnosed with severe generalized anxiety and had learned through my stellar home life not to ever trust my gut. We were making our way up a hill for the third or fourth time when a white, windowless van pulled out of a driveway several houses behind us. Obviously, we thought nothing of it. It was a large neighborhood. Even if there weren't loads of people outside, there were still cars traveling constantly in and out. Admittedly, being young, dumb teens, we were totally hogging the road and didn't even realize until noticing that the van was driving quite slowly behind us. I remember calling for my friend to move to the curb so this guy could go around us. And she did. But the creep mobile didn't change course. It stayed several yards behind us, crawling along at the same pace as we were. This is when that sinking, anxious feeling started to kick in for me, but I was quick to remind myself that my brain was broken and so odds or nothing was actually wrong. Besides, my friend didn't say anything about it, so it must have been fine. I mean, she had stopped talking all of a sudden after hours of us yammering on. But it was probably nothing. Thankfully, we were about to round the corner to the street her house was on so that gave me enough optimism to push the fear as far down as I could. After all, the van didn't turn. We both looked behind us to see and half embarrassedly smiled at one another for being worried about something stupid. Still, I couldn't help myself and stole another glance over my shoulder. That was when I saw the van had gone into a driveway and was now backing out of it, turning to follow us down this new street. We must have come from my house because I specifically remember thinking that that was where we had to get back to even as we neared her own. At this point, with the van still creeping along behind us and no one else in sight, we both started to panic. It's okay, I thought. At least we're together. Safety in numbers and all that. That, of course, was when I looked over to see my friend pedaling furiously toward her own house. I must have called for her again or something and gotten waved off because any composure I had managed to hold on to completely disappeared by now and I bolted down the street as fast as my scooter could carry me, knowing that the end sloped downward and would help me speed away. The next bit happened too fast to completely remember, but long story short, I was so busy looking behind me as I raced down the hill that I came about a foot away from hitting a car. And whoever was driving that van must have seen the other car or something because the next time I turned back, they were long gone. The car in front of me drove off, somewhat irritated, and I ran full speed back to my house, throwing my scooter down as soon as I hit the driveway and racing inside. I don't think I said anything afterward. I convinced myself that I was just being paranoid. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. 
It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd as I had never smelled that before around that house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark, and this particular phone was so bright I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9-something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in and a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank God he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic just a foot or so away from the access so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room, followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1,000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped. All the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pin tube which the police said people often use to smoke meth, so they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. 
They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day, I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house, though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. This is not a new story. This happened way back in 1980. I was five years old, and I was invited to a neighbor's birthday party. We lived in the quiet suburbs of Baltimore, Maryland. It was an idyllic town. Trees lined the streets, looking over the neighborhood like giant looming sentinels. It was early October. I remember this because the houses were decorated for Halloween. The boys' parents pulled out all of the stops to make their son's party one to remember. There was a slow-moving, sad-faced donkey that the smaller children were permitted to ride. I was not allowed to ride the donkey. I was a fat boy, even at age five. I was also as loud as I was fat. It was my loud mouth that caused this pleasant afternoon of cake, ice cream, and piñatas to quickly unravel into a horrifying nightmare. Aside from the usual accoutrements at a seven-year-old's party, there was a clown. The clown walked around silently, prancing and smiling. He would laugh silently. He would do the old I got your nose trick and pull coins out from behind our ears. He made balloon animals and attempted to ride a unicycle. The other kids laughed. I hated the clown. Everything about him made me uncomfortable. And because of this, my fat five-year-old self decided it was a decent idea to give the clown a hard time. Birthday Boy announced aloud that it was time to head inside to see the special clown magic show. All the kids went into the living room and sat on the hardwood floor. I stood in the back. The clown proceeded with the magic show. He pulled a fake rabbit out of his hat and performed other hack tricks as I stood in the back of the room and jeered him. I would yell out how the tricks were done. The clown continued to silently smile, making no sound as he went about his magical presentation. His face said happiness, but his eyes screamed in rage at me. This went on for 15 minutes. The kids laughed as the clown fumbled through some crappy dime store magic tricks. I do not know if it was an act of mercy, but birthday boy's parents shouted ping out of time. And all the kids ran outside to smash a cardboard donkey stuffed with candy. After a few minutes outside, all of the fruit punch I drank throughout the day went out. I scurried back into the house in search of the toilet. The house was quiet and the sun had shifted in the sky, leaving the kitchen and the adjoining hallway bathed in a murky early evening light. As I walked through the kitchen and into the hall, from a room in the hall, stepped the clown into the hallway. He stood there staring at me, staring at him. It seemed like one of those Wild West showdowns from the cowboy movies my dad used to watch on television. He lurched slowly toward me, his painted smile unwavering, but his eyes, bloodshot and filled with unbridled hatred. Here, Piggy Piggy. I walked a few steps in reverse before spinning on my heels and trying to make it to the kitchen. I felt a large hand land on my shoulder. I spun around forcefully and fell to the floor. The clown stood above me for a moment before putting a giant clown shoe on my fat chest. I remember trying to squirm, and I remember wanting to scream and cry for help. But it never happened. He stood over me, pinning me to the floor before brandishing one of those old-style seltzer bottles. He proceeded to spray the crotch of my pants, and in a sing-song voice, he cooed piggy going pee-pee, piggy going pee-pee until the contents of the bottle were drained. 
When he removed his foot from my chest, I lashed out with my feet, kicking at his shins and trying to scurry away at the same time. I ran into a pantry and slammed the door. It was really a terrible hiding place. He had to see where I went. The pantry was about four feet away from where I was laying on the floor just moments ago. It was dark in the pantry and smelled of pine sole cleaning solvent. There was no lock on the inside to protect me from the clown. In the dark pantry, I slid to the floor and tried not to sob uncontrollably. Minutes passed. Those minutes felt like hours. I heard no sound other than my wheezing and a fear fart that squeaked out. Oh, piggy piggy. Did you make poopy in the pantry? The voice came from inside the dark pantry in which I was hiding. Or so I thought. I froze in fear. Not moving. Not breathing. I did not know where the clown was. If he was in the pantry with me, I needed to get out. If he was out there, I needed to stay in the pantry. I lowered my head to the floor and squinted through the gap between the bottom of the pantry door and the floor. There was not much to see. What little light bled through the bottom of the door was quickly blacked out and a bloodshot eye stared back at me from the other side of the door. There was a low, guttural laugh, and a voice that either hissed Boo Piggy or Poo Piggy. I squeezed my eyes shut and started crying at a near hysterical level. The door swung open, and I screamed as loud as I could. Standing in the doorway was my dad. What the hell are you doing? he asked. Clown. I screamed. He carried me out of the pantry and out of the house and back to the safety of our house. 